In this video, I will be painting this family of tigers in my new favorite technique, combination of watercolor with soft pastels. My goal will be not to copy the photo exactly, but to improve on it. As you see, this photo was made by a professional photographer. Gina Rosner generously allowed artists to use it for free for reference. Even though this photo is very high quality, there are a couple of things I want to change to make it my own and to make the artwork not a copy, but my own interpretation of this subject. This photo is pretty monochromatic. As you see, it has basically browns, oranges and whites. And of course, that's what the tigers look like. Photographers can easily change their subject unless they extensively use Photoshop. The first thing I'm going to try and do is expand the color palette of this photo. If you watch the video, you will see how I will achieve that. It will be at the later stages of working on this painting. And the second thing is that this photo is uniformly crisp. In my painting, I will try to narrow the focal point of this composition. Faces of those three tigers are the focal point of the the photo as well, but I will try to make the rest, the surroundings, softer and less detailed than they are in the reference photo. I will be working on a fairly large sheet of watercolor paper. It's 18 by 24 inches. It's 140 pound cold press paper. To use a charcoal rub, I would have to print the reference photo exact same format. I don't have a printer at home that prints that large. So it will be easier for me to use a grid to transfer reference onto my watercolor paper. This also gives me opportunity to show you how to use the support technique, how to transfer reference using a grid. Here's my reference photo. I printed it out on 11 by 17 sheet of paper and I'm going to divide it into squares. They will not be exactly squares, but into sections. Let's do four vertically. That will be easy for me to divide it in half and then each half into quarters. And maybe I'll just divide it into half vertically. I think that will be enough. I can always add some more lines if I need to when I start drawing. All right, this is done. I already taped and pinned my sheet of watercolor paper to my board. I'm going to put this photo on the side somewhere so you can see what I'm doing. I will do the same thing to my watercolor paper with a pencil, of course. I'm going to divide it into halves horizontally and into quarters vertically. I'm using a um, quilting ruler. It's very handy because it has straight lines and I can very easily draw straight angles with it. I don't have to have a straight edge. So I'm going to start in the center and see where the grid intersects the tiger's face and start positioning different elements of the drawing in the same places where I see them in the reference photo. The eye touches the grid line, so I need to place it there. I'm going to draw an additional vertical line in between these two, so the other eye is slightly beyond it. Let's draw the nose, kind of holding the spot with my finger on the reference photo, not to lose my spot. So without going into details, I'm just outlining different elements of the tiger's face. He's got his big white whiskers on the side here. I will also be verifying this drawing when I start painting. It's much easier for me to draw with a brush than with a pencil because the marks are so much broader and so much easier to correct, but I do need some sort of a guideline to get started. It's very hard to paint something that's not abstract with watercolor without preliminary drawing. All right, let's move on to that second tiger. His ear intersects this horizontal central line. His line is right under the cheek of that bigger tiger, so there's something wrong with the face. So let's draw an additional line here in the center. The nose only touches that line, it's not on the line. I could have attempted drawing these tigers just by sight measuring without the help of the grid, but there is high probability of making a mistake in this case just because the sheet of paper is so large. So it's hard for me to see the whole thing and it would be very easy to mess up the composition. The larger the sheet, the harder it is to get the composition right from the first go. If I worked on even larger 
format. If you ever saw my work on my website, I sometimes paint really large. Like I had a painting that was seven feet by almost eight feet. Then it's impossible to draw accurately on such a large format. So I have to do a sketch and then project it on the panel and trace it. I'm using an additional horizontal line as well to check my drawing. Something is not quite right with the face of that baby tiger. I think I'm making it too small. So the nose needs to be a little bit lower and the mouth as well. I'm trying to scrunch it, so I need to make it larger. I'm using an eraser. I'm trying not to press on it because it's very easy to damage watercolor paper and then you will have an attractive texture when you start painting. That's why I also use dry cleaning pad that's very gentle on the surface of watercolor paper. All right, let's add the third tiger. I wonder if it's the mama tiger. I need to get the angle of her nose right in relationship to that vertical line that I have, my vertical grid line. The eye is going to be somewhere here. This is a difficult three quarter angle. I might have to verify it at some later stage of my painting development. We see a little tip of the ear and the back is going to touch the edge of the paper. I'm going to take off the excess graphite with my dry cleaning pad, get rid of the shavings, and I am ready to start my watercolor on the painting. The colors I'm going to use are Nougat Bosch, permanent orange. Also want to use some burnt orange from Daniel Smith use all my yellows and oranges that I have at my disposal. And instead of brown or black, I'm going to squeeze out some Daniel Smith Scarbrazole Violet, which mixed with orange will give me brown or black. I added some Hansa Yellow Light to my new gamboche, so I will have a little more variety in the yellows as well. I'm going to start painting wet on wet. I'm using a big flat brush to apply clean water to my whole sheet. My first layer will be very loose, very painterly because I want to soften all the sharp details that I see in the reference photo. And like I said in the beginning, I want defined edges and sharp details only in the focal point, which will be the faces of those three tigers. Everything else I want to be soft and watercolory and I want the colors to run and blend. So I need to paint on wet surface. I will start as usual. I have a big brush here, number 24. And I will start as usual with lightest color, which will be my yellow. So I'm looking for lightest areas on the tigers and I'm painting them with my yellow wash. I am of course trying to avoid white where they have white stripes. I'm trying to avoid these areas. Some color of course will leak, but it's okay. I will be using opaque white to bring back the edges of these areas. in the areas that I want to leave white, at least more or less as much as possible, because as we know, watercolor will not go onto dry paper. It will only spread where the paper is wet. Tigers are pretty complex subjects to paint because of the fur, of the texture of the fur, and also because of all the stripes and markings that they have. It's a little bit difficult to figure out what's what and what values to use on them. So I think this method makes it a little bit easy because wet on wet watercolor forces me to work with large forms and then I will add the details after all the overall tonal relationships are already resolved. My next 
color will be burnt orange. It's from Daniel Smith, the secondary color set. I switched to a flat brush. I have enough water on my paper. I want a little bit dry application, more pigment than water. I am working on mid-tones now with this color. It helps a lot to squint when looking at the reference photo. So we don't see all the stripes and all the little details, but we see slightly darker areas on the tigers. shadows in between them where they press against each other so we can drop in some burnt orange there for now and then I will need to deepen that shadow with subsequent layers. I'm going to paint the background on them very abstractly, very loosely. I just want to show a little bit of texture there. I will vignette it. This again will help with my task of focusing the attention more on the faces of those tigers more than in the reference photo. So I don't want a lot of detail in the background. I want it to be very abstract and make some sort of a transition between the main subject and the surrounding white paper and make it very loose and abstract. It's time to work on dark areas. I switched to a 3 8 of an inch dagger brush and I am using Corbazol Violet. My paper is still wet and I'm dropping that paint, I have plenty of paint on my brush, into the areas where I see dark shadows. Where two forms touch, that's where I am applying the next layer. I love this dagger brush because it helps me to work very loosely. It's kind of a little floppy, but it's also very pointy. So I can go between larger areas and smaller details, like fine lines even, very easily. So when I don't want precision, I use this brush. And I will remind you that I am working on my loose watercolor underpainting for my composition and finishing and details and finishing touches will be applied with dry pastels. Working loosely with watercolor from the start also helps me not to get obsessed with the features on tigers' faces. They're just so cute and they draw our attention immediately, especially the one on the right that's looking at us. So I am trying very hard to treat them as an abstract form and to get the tonal relationships right distribute all my colors instead of painting, you know, the cute nose and the eyes and the ears, because that's a recipe for messing up your painting, making it fractured, losing harmony and unity in your artwork. We need to work from larger forms to smaller forms and not the other way around. I see some artists on YouTube, usually self-taught artists. They concentrate on details a lot, but if you gradually approach the details, you will get them right. It's much harder to get the overall form right and find the proper place for those details. The details by themselves don't do us any good if they're in the wrong place.
I'm starting to use more concentrated paint. Also, my paper starts to dry a little bit. It's a slow process because I saturated it with so much water but I'm gradually using a little more paint. I also neutralized that corbazole violet with some burnt orange. Together they give me very dark brown, almost black color. And as you see, I am slowly giving a little more precision to my painting. All those small details will also need to be unified, so they're not just little brush strokes here and there, so that's what I'm doing now. A little more burnt orange. It gives me a light brown color and I can unify different details and find some more of those, I won't say dark, but they're kind of dark mid-tone areas on the tigers. The left sides of their faces will be in shadow, so I need to find all those smaller shadows in them as well. Working on a large complex painting like this is not a particularly fast process. I usually can get a painting done in about half an hour or so, maybe an hour. This one took me probably three hours to paint, not counting the drying time, just because it's so large and there are so many details. I painted it over three days because as soon as I start feeling tired or like I don't want to paint anymore, I know I need to quit because I know if I kind of force myself to work, I am going to mess things up. So you have to have energy and you have to have inspiration to work on the painting and not treat it as a chore that just needs to be <laughs> finished. You see right now how versatile is this three eighths of an inch dagger brush. I was painting small lines with it, but I can also use it on the side and paint larger areas. I don't have to switch between different brushes and I can also feather out my brush strokes and create that fur texture on the tigers. <laughs> of corbazole violet. You can see now why I used those additional cups and not my regular palette because large painting requires a lot of paint. to darken the background behind the tigers with a mixture of corbazole violet and burnt orange but I decided not to paint that dark shape that entrance to the cave whatever it is behind in the upper left corner because like I said I want to vignette my composition and I don't want to bring shapes fully to the edges of the paper I want to just create some sort of a transition Again, dagger brush allows me to do that because it creates all these interesting edges with its bristles. Let's put a few brush strokes on the bottom as well. And you will notice I am not painting the stripes on the tigers. I'm kind of hinting at them in a few places just to mark the place, make sure that my drawing is correct, that I didn't veer off while I was painting loosely. But all the details will be added at the next stage when I start working with pastels. My watercolor on the painting is dry. It took a few hours to dry because I used so much water, but now I can finally move to the next step and work with dry pastels. I'm making a tortillon that I will use to smudge the pastels. I could have bought one, but it's very easy to make it out of a sheet of just printer paper. I roll it up very tightly. I use a piece of scotch tape to hold the end in place and I'm going to trim the ends with my scissors at an angle and we are ready to get started. The stripes on the tigers are all black, all the same color, but I am not going to make them neither black nor the same color. It's one of the things that photographer couldn't change. 
but I as an artist have artistic license to make them all different colors. So I'm going to select some dry pastels. I'm picking some dark blues, some blue greens. I have a purple as well. Some of these blues might be a little too intense, but we will see when we start working. I like to pick the pastel colors first so I don't have to rummage through this giant box while I'm working. I also have an orange that will probably come in handy and I have a brown color, but we will see if I'm going to use that. I'm worried brown will look too flat and too different from my blues and greens that I intend to use for the stripes, but we'll see how the painting develops. And I'm starting to paint the texture, the stripes on the tigers. I'm thinking in the areas of light, I can use lighter blues and greens. And in the darker areas, I will use this intense blue-green color in place of black. I also have this yellow handy, so very easy to add some in the eyes. I can get my turkey on and start blending, start smudging the pastels right away. And I can also add some white. Pastels are very soft, have good coverage. I can immediately add white. I want to do this right away just to see how this painting will develop. I think using white pastels for whites, to restore whites, will work really well. I don't like the texture that dry pastels create on watercolor paper. The paper is very textured, as you know. Even though it's cold pressed, it has quite a bit of texture. So I will do my best to blend the pastels, to smooth them and make them blend with watercolor instead of letting them have some texture and letting them stand out. I don't think that looks right, looks kind of painted on top of watercolor, but I want this all to be a harmonious painting without any of that characteristic pastel texture. So it's obviously mixed media, but I don't want it to look like mixed media. I want it to look like an organic technique. I sped up this portion of the video. Pastels have very small surface. The process is pretty time consuming and laborious. I don't want this video to last forever and ever. I think you understand what I'm trying to achieve here. Switching between different colors of pastels also takes a little bit of time because I need to think about it. And sometimes I apply pastels and then I decide that this color doesn't work. So I apply different color on top and blend them together. But I think you can see where this painting is going. I am getting all the details on the tigers with dry pastels. <laughs>
when all the pastels work was finished, I thought some of the darkest areas lacked depth because a pastel is a dry material. It sits on top of the paper and it has that chalky quality. I would say it lacked depth a little bit. So I went back to my watercolors. I mixed burnt orange into my Corbazol violet and I applied just a few brush strokes in the areas of darkest darks. Again, I squinted when looking at the reference photo. I found those darkest areas. They were mostly where two forms touched, where the tiger's heads are all touching, also under the cheek of the tiger on the right hand side. So very quickly, just a few brush strokes to deepen the darks. That gave my painting a lot more dimensionality, a lot more depth. I increased the tonal range that way. Important not to overdo it. Just add a few of those small details. I know this was a pretty long detailed video. Let me know in comments if you like this format and if you like this technique, what do you think about the final result? I know tigers are very dangerous creatures, but they're just majestic and beautiful, so I really enjoyed painting them. I hope you check out the playlist dedicated to painting other animals as well here on my channel. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one here on Tamarap Studios channel. Help other artists to see this video by liking or sharing it. To see future videos, subscribe and click the bell button to be notified when they're published. Thanks again and stay creative!